Hello and welcome to this knowledge clip on the International Court of Justice judgment in the case concerning United States diplomatic and consular staff in Tehran, also referred to as the Tehran hostages case. The dispute between the United States and Iran arose out of the seizure of the United States Embassy in Tehran and the taking of United States diplomatic and consular staff as hostages by a group of militant demonstrators on November 4, 1979. Let's take a look at some key facts behind this dispute. Following a period of unrest, the then reigning monarch of Iran, uh, Shah Pahlavi, leaves the country for exile in January 1979, and less than a month after that, the uh, last government to be appointed by the Shah falls. A referendum is held at the end of March 1979, and on the basis of that referendum, it is decided that the Islamic Republic of Iran should be established under the leadership of Ayatollah Khomeini. Following the establishment of the Islamic Republic, the relationships between uh, the U.S. and Iran deteriorated as Iran was accusing the U.S. of interfering in its internal affairs. Now, at some point during 1979, the U.S. started contemplating whether it should allow the Shah, uh, who at the time was in Mexico, to enter United States territory in order to seek medical treatment. Of course, the U.S. was afraid of the impact that such a decision would have on the already strained relations between the U.S. and Iran. So in October 1979, there was a number of meetings between uh, the U.S. diplomatic authorities uh, in Iran, in Tehran, and representatives of the Iranian government, during which, first, the U.S. informed the authorities that they had decided to grant um, the Shah entry into the U.S. for purposes of medical treatment, but at the same time, they requested assurances from the Iranian authorities that the embassy compound was safe and that the diplomats were safe. And of course, such assurances were given by the Iranian authorities. Following the entry of the Shah into the territory of the U.S., uh, there was massive arrest in Iran and there was a number of demonstrations across the country. Now, during one such anti-U.S. demonstration in Tehran, a group of militant demonstrators entered the embassy, seized the embassy by force, and took um, the U.S. diplomats within the embassy hostages. That was uh, for November 1979. Immediately after those events, of course, the U.S. protested and requested that the Iranian authorities guarantee the safety of the diplomats, that, it, uh, that the authorities regain control over the embassy and free the hostages. Of course, nothing of the sort happened. So on November 29, 1979, the U.S. instituted proceedings before the International Court of Justice. Now, one of the key questions that the court was called upon to decide was the following. Where the seizure of the United States Embassy in Iran and the taking of the diplomatic staff as hostages attributable to Iran? Why is this important? Attribution is a fundamental concept of the law on international responsibility. In order for a state to be responsible for specific conduct, that is for a specific act or omission, such an act or an omission should be attributable to that state. In other words, attribution tells us when specific act or omission amounts to an act or omission of a given state. So in this specific instance, the question was whether Iran was to be held responsible for the seizure of the embassy and the taking of the hostages. Now, the court looked into the matter uh, by distinguishing between two key phases of events. So the first phase covers the actual armed attack on the U.S. Embassy by militants on November 4, 1979. And the second phase covers the whole series of events which occurred following the occupation of the Embassy. Now, vis-à-vis -vis the first phase of events, the court underlined that no suggestion uh, had been made, and I quote, that the militants, when they executed their attack on the embassy, had any form of official status as recognized agents or organs of the Iranian state. Their conduct cannot therefore be regarded as imputable to that state on that basis. 
And here the court uses the term imputably synonymously with the term attributably. So what the court is essentially saying is the following. Uh, the militant demonstrators did not have any official link to the state. They were not organs of the state, of course. They were not agents. They were private individuals. And as such, their conduct in seizing the embassy and taking the diplomats hostages cannot be attributable to Iran and thus cannot generate the responsibility of Iran. But at the same time, the court stated that the seizure of the embassy immediately created a number of duties upon Iran, amongst which the obligation to make every effort, to take every appropriate step to bring uh, the occupation of the embassy to an end and to free the hostages. And these were obligations that uh, bound Iran under international law, both conventional, that is the Convention on Diplomatic Relations, and customary. But the Iranian authorities did nothing of the sort. So essentially, the court um, held that the omission on behalf of the Iranian authorities to take all the measures necessary uh, under international law was an omission attributable to Iran. So Iran was responsible for the omission of its own organs, but it was not responsible for the actual seizure and of the embassy and the taking of the hostages. Now, moving to the second phase of events, now the court underlined that the Iranian authorities expressly approved and endorsed the conduct of the militant demonstrators in a number of public statements. What is more, Ayatollah Khomeini issued a decree on November 17, 1979, according to which, quote, the United States Embassy and the hostages would remain as they were until the United States had handed over the former Shah for trial, unquote. So essentially, Iran endorsed an action that, as we said, was not at the first place attributable to it. It acknowledged this as a policy of the state. So the court then proceeded to a very significant holding, and it held that the result of that policy, the policy of endorsement, of acknowledgement, was, quote, fundamentally to transform the legal nature of the situation created by the occupation of the embassy and the detention of its diplomatic and consular staff as hostages. The approval given to these facts by the Ayatollah Khomeini and other organs of the Iranian state, and the decision to perpetuate them, translated continuing occupation of the embassy and detention of the hostages into acts of that state. The militants, authors of the invasion and jailers of the hostages had now become agents of the state for whose acts the state itself was internationally responsible. So essentially what the court did here was the following. First, it found that the seizure of the embassy and the taking of the hostages was perpetrated by private individuals that had absolutely no link to the state during the first phase. But during the second stage of events, during the second phase of events, because of the policy followed by Iran, these uh, militant demonstrators essentially became agents of the state. Iran acknowledged the conduct of the demonstrators as conduct of the state. Thus, ex post facto, the seizure of the embassy and the taking of the hostages was attributable to Iran. So on the basis of these considerations, by 13 votes to two, the court decided that the Islamic Republic of Iran had violated in several respects obligations owed to the United States and the international conventions and custom, and that the violations of these obligations engaged the responsibility of the Islamic Republic of Iran towards the US. Thank you for watching this knowledge clip.